Hello and welcome to the National Human Genome Research Institute's sixth event in our Genomics and the Media series. My name is Sarah Bates and I'm the Communications Chief for NHGRI. I'm excited to give a short introduction for today's event and to serve as the moderator for our distinguished guest who I will introduce in a moment. Today's topic is bringing science to people through the radio, which nowadays often means through your smartphone. The internet has transformed the way audio stories are told, just as it has so many aspects of communications. 25 years ago, we had to tune in at a certain time to catch our favorite program. Now, we can listen anytime from an app or a streaming service. How has this technology revolution changed the way these stories are told? Or has, has it changed them at all? For, for many of us, Joe Palka is the name that comes to mind when we think of a compelling radio story. I have certainly been influenced and inspired by his reporting. Uh, his NPR segments opened on my mind to how fast jellyfish can sting, to the mysterious landscape of Mars, and to the ethics of stem cell research, among many other topics. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Palka is, of course, a science correspondent for NPR, and we have him here for the next hour to answer your questions about how he approaches his science communications work. Now, before I turn it over to Joe, um, I wanna give you a little bit more background on this series so you can look at our other videos that have already been posted and also our upcoming event in May. Uh, today's event is one in a long series that features trailblazers in science communications, talking about their craft with someone at NHGRI and taking questions from all of you. Each guest is an expert in communicating about genomics across various media from podcasting to preprints to everything in between. NHGRI's goal with this series is to talk about different ways of communicating about the fast paced field of genomics and other areas of science, to give you behind the scenes stories about breaking news, as well as to discuss the unique challenges and opportunities each medium can bring. We've had an amazing lineup for this series. I can't believe uh, we're on our second to last speaker. Our previous guest was podcaster Liz Wayne. Our next guest will be Editor-in-Chief of, of Nature, Magdalena Skipper in May. And you can find details at genome.gov slash GAM. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Joe Palka, Dr. Joe Palka. Joe is a science correspondent for NPR. At the moment, he is on a fellowship leave working to create a database of resources for scientists who want to become better communicators. <sighs> What a mission. He comes to journalism from a, back, from a science background, having received a PhD in psychology from the University of California at Santa Cruz, where he worked on human sleep physiology. So can't wait to ask about that. Since joining NPR, Joe has covered a wide range of science topics, although for the past two years, he has mostly focused on COVID-19. He is founder of the NPR SciCommerce program, a collective of science communicators. And I was just looking at their Twitter feed. Palka has also worked, Joe has also worked on a television, as a television science producer, a senior correspondent for Science Magazine and Washington News Editor of Nature. He's won numerous awards, several of which came with attractive certificates. I don't see any, I don't see any of those in the background. Mm -hmm. And he is co-author of Annoying, the Science of What Bugs Us. I personally first met Joe in 2005 at the science, Santa Fe Science Writers Workshop where he was mentoring young science writers. So this is really lifelong calling. I distinctly remember both of us at one point running from a wasp while we were on a field trip. <laughs> Joe, thank you for taking time to talk to us today. We're really excited to have you here. So my first question is, what is not in your official bio? <laughs> Oh, well, what's not in my official bio? How much time do you have? Um, it's interesting. Uh, thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, uh, yeah, I'm glad that you cleared up the fact that I'm not a medical doctor. And actually, that's what I was going to talk about a little bit, just in my own background. So I went to college at, uh, at Pomona College in Cal Claremont, California, intending to be a classics major. But I found out that Greek was taught at 8 in the morning, and that was the end of my classics <laughs> career. Um, I got interested in sleep actually as a freshman in, uh, in college, and maybe we'll have a chance to tell the story of why that happened. But I didn't take any, uh, I took psychology classes and graduated with a degree in psychology, and I really was not science 
you know, except for social science and physio physiology, you didn't really do much science. But for some reason, I was convinced uh, by a family friend that I wanted to go to medical school, and that was the thing I should do. So I, uh, I, I went back to school, undergraduate, for a year to take all my pre-med classes. And then I was, I was out, you know, I had to wait. I've sent in all my applications. And oh, by the way, I mean, since I'm not a medical doctor, I, I wound up not getting in anywhere. <laughs> But that's okay. I get to go back and lord it over the schools that that rejected me. Um, but uh, but I had to find work um, that very first uh, year where I was done taking classes and to, to wait to see what happened with my med school applications. And a friend of a friend said that there was a need for a um, he needed a lab technician. And so I got to be very good friends with two guys who were both postdocs at. Grips Clinic and Research Foundation in San Diego. And maybe if you can show that first uh, graphic. Slide number four. Yeah, there it is. So I like this picture. Um, in case you can't tell already, that's me on the far left. And a friend of mine whose first name was Tova, I think, and the last name I've forgotten, I have to confess. And the three people sitting next to me uh, is, uh, well, the, the guard on the far right is Jerry Callahan. He was a postdoc in uh, mouse genetics. And the guy sitting uh, next to him is a guy named Jim Allison, who was doing work um, uh, on uh, T cell. Well, actually we were doing work on HLA and trying to amass enough HLA to do a protein sequence of HLA-9 because there was no <laughs> DNA sequencing. And that's Melinda, his wife on, on the right. And we're down in Tijuana, Mexico on a uh, well, we're not drinking Coke. I guess Tova was drinking Pepsi, but I, the rest of us were drinking beer. And... You look like you're a band on tour. Yeah, it, it has a little bit of that quality. And, well, yeah. yeah, so, so uh, I mean, I worked with Jim for a year and that's actually where I learned a lot about what it means to be a scientist. And uh, it was very, 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 very rewarding. Um, uh, but he actually, became quite famous and I interviewed him a couple of years ago. He, he actually was very fond of, of playing music and was played music with um, Willie Nelson's band. But now we can show the picture of me interviewing him in the later years and you get to decide who's, uh, who's who in this picture if, if we can bring the next one up. Oh, that's it. So that's Jim on the right as you look at the picture and me. And the thing that makes that initial year so weird now in retrospect is that uh, many of you probably know Jim won the Nobel Prize in 2018 or 19 something like that for checkpoint inhibitors so uh, there's an awful lot of people who uh, believe they owe their life to Jim Allison and and he told me uh, after he won actually after he won the last prize that he was he was he was kind of pissed off that he didn't win it for basic research, but he won it for applied research because he's always thought of himself as a basic researcher. But anyway, um, did I he went tell to... the Nobel Committee that? Sorry? Did he tell that to the Nobel Committee? No, he just said thank you, I believe. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, well, yeah, again, it's funny about Nobel Prizes and, and what they do to people, but um, it's, it's interesting. Anyway, uh, so I, well, as I told you, I didn't get into medical school, I got into graduate school and I was uh, four years into my graduate degree also working on physiological psychology and not really sure that I had, I mean, it's not a great reason to start graduate school, you know, and, and I certainly didn't say this on my application, I wanna go because I didn't get into medical school, but I, um, I didn't really have the passion that you need to complete uh, a lifetime as a scientist. And, so I wound up getting a fellowship uh, called the AAAS Mass Media and Science and Engineering Fellows Program Fellowship. Spent a summer in Washington, DC at a television station. Just thought, oh man, this is for me. And it's really nice when the when you know when you sort of go from I'm not really sure what I'm doing here to I know exactly what I want to do, and it's be a science journalist. And through a very series of very strange twists of fate. I wound up going from local television news to nature, which doesn't happen very often, and then from nature to science. Uh, and then from science, um, I got shipped off to uh, N NPR as a one-year replacement in 1992. <laughs> and um, uh, the rest is uh, me talking on the radio for 30 years, which is pretty stunning. And this room you see uh, behind me, 
And the sound you hear coming through your speakers or hear headphones now is, is where I've been doing all my broadcasting for the last year. NPR, uh, I haven't been in the NPR headquarters or any NPR building since March of 2020. And they equipped us with, uh, let's see if I can grab it quickly. Is this a tote bag? Are you gonna pull up the tote bag? Here we go. See, very, oh, very uh, even better. sophisticated looking microphone and, uh, and these earbuds that keep falling out. So it's embarrassing when you're in live radio and your earbuds fall out, by the way. And you know, you talk on the radio and it's like you're in a studio, but you're not. Anyway, that's what the last year has been like, crazy, but fun and stressful. Yeah, I think a lot of us can, can relate to that, not having left the rooms in which we work. Yep. Um, so, uh, so we we are we get we're getting some questions, but I do want to ask you a little bit more about your background before we get to them. So, what what really drew you into radio specifically? What was it about telling stories, you know, audio stories that really appealed to you? Well, maybe yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you the honest answer, and that's nothing that drew me into radio. Um, I I I left Science Magazine because I wasn't getting along well with my editor and I would have taken a job as a anything uh, in journalism. Uh, it just happened that Richard Harris is, and I uh, met up uh, when he first came to NPR in 1986 and we'd, well, we met up shortly after that and, and we'd stayed friends and NPR uh, had an opening uh, and he kept saying, oh, you should come over here. You like it. And I, I thought, I mean, at one time they asked me if I wanted to be a science editor. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, I want to be a star. You know, I want to be on the radio. And uh, but th that was only in like I want my byline. I didn't want to be an editor in print either. I mean, I wanted people to know that it was me, me. I wrote it, me. And so, um, yeah, when they offered me this gig as a radio reporter, I took it and I had I had toyed with radio. I mean, I, I liked it. As, I think the main thing that I liked about radio was I liked to listen to the radio. And yeah. I, I, I think I've, I mean, I, I have, you know, you said you can listen whenever you like, which is, I, is true. I, I know that. But, but I listen when it's on the air. <laughs> I mean, I listen to shows I don't like because they're on the air and the show I do like isn't on the air <laughs> because I like to listen to the radio. And, uh, and, and so I think um, in that sense, I was drawn to radio because I liked listening. And I'm one of these people, there are some people who are visual learners and some people who are oral, AU oral learners. And I think I'm the latter. So I don't need to see something, but I pay really close attention when people are talking to me. And I think that's why radio was a good fit for me. How did you feel when, uh, when people on the radio had to come out from behind the radio? Yeah, that's a, yeah, I actually thought a lot about that. I didn't like it. Uh, I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I never thought I could be on television because I didn't spend enough time combing my hair. Uh, uh, so that was a, a big problem. And I didn't think I looked that good on television. I, mean, I guess I've, I guess I've gotten used to that as well as my voice. But um, uh, yeah, I, um, radio was a good fit it was a good fit well i mean not no one can look like a young john allison really <laughs> Jim allison. yeah he was he was he was he was something um but i um uh, yeah i uh, i liked it and uh and and yeah it suited me well so we are getting um a couple of questions specific to science communication. Uh, one is, how have you helped scientists become better communicators with the public? Well, that's actually something that I, I don't know, I, I've tried to help. I, I mean, it's kind of hard to know whether I have helped or not, um, you know, because uh, I don't get to measure very often. But the main, okay, there's really, I think, only like a few um, they're not even tricks. They're just things you have to understand. And the hardest thing, and this is, I think this is where my, my own scientific training, you know, as long ago as it was, and, and as short term as it was compared to the rest of my career, at least it gave me an understanding of what you, what your thought pattern is like when you're talking to other scientists. And it's, it, I promise you, it's very different than talking to the public. 
And the problem that many, many scientists have is they, they can't let go of the fact that the public needs a different level of, of specificity than a scientific audience. And there are, the more you know about a topic in a way, the harder it is to report on it because there's so many details that you want to include. And I think, you know, certainly for graduate students and maybe for senior people as well, there's little, there's this little voice in your head saying, oh, if I say this, you know, somebody who's got the knives out for me is going to, uh, is going to attack and I don't, I don't want that. So I'm going to be really careful when I talk about this topic. And it's so unfair because it's, th I mean, for me anyway, it's three and a half minutes. I mean, what, how could I possibly include the nuance of, you know, 30 years of research in three and a half minutes? It's, it would be insulting to think that everything you'd ever done in research could be explained in three and a half minutes. Cause that would, to me, it would suggest you hadn't accomplished very much. So, so it's letting go of that. And the other thing is, and this is important for people to understand when you go to a scientific talk, I mean, even the people in this audience, you know, they, they, they voted, they said, I want to hear this. You know, nobody twisted their arm and said you had had to go. Um, it's not like education where you take the class and there's a test later, no test after this, you know, <laughs> you can listen or not, or, or, or be playing uh, Pokemon Go at the moment. I don't know, but um, you don't have to do it. And on the radio, I mean, you can be, they can turn you off at any second. It, it's, so there's an element of entertainment. I mean, you can't just say you should listen to this because it's good for you because that we call uh, spinach journalism. Um, there's, a, you have to, you have to at least, at the very least sound interested yourself and um, but more to the point, you have to you have to try to make it appealing in some way. And I don't I mean, all I can do really is amuse myself or do it in a way that I find entertaining. And I know and, 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 and I think this is why diversity has become such a, an interesting question. I know that my sense of humor and my background and my ethnicity and my age are going to create certain parameters that I'm going to make that sound hilarious to me or powerful to me and they may not to others and I can I can try I cannot try to understand and be 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 broad-minded or 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 ec ecumenical what's is that the word I want anyway about how I present things but in the end I'm going to look like this and I'm going to sound like this and and there's nothing I can do about that. And so I think the only solution isn't, you know, to, to retrain me, which I mean, I, I will do my retraining as best I can, but rather to get people from different backgrounds to be telling similar stories and reaching audiences that they'll resonate with more than I will. So I know you've interviewed quite a few NIH scientists in your time and, and we have a lot of them watching right now and uh, other staff at NIH. Um, what, you know, given your, all your, your interactions with NIH scientists, what tips would you have for those who do want to communicate better with press or with the public? Uh, well, uh, you only have three minutes to, to yeah, sum no, up. That, that's yeah. fine. Uh, no, I don't. I, as I said, oh, I was forgot the other thing um, that I always try to tell people who say they want to communicate is just do it. Oh, there's a cat coming in. Go away. I left the door open. That's okay. I have a dog. Probably wants dinner. Um, yeah. uh, you have to practice. I mean, mm -hmm. the people go to workshops or go to an hour lecture and I say, oh, do all these things. And people go, I'll do it. And then they go out and try and, and it doesn't work and they get discouraged. I, I, my analogy is like, I could tell you how to drive a car and tell you where the mirror is and where the accelerator is and how to steer and all that. Okay, here's the keys, go have a good time. It just doesn't work that way. You have to do it and figure out what works for you and make mistakes and hopefully not kill anybody. That's the nice thing about science communication. Usually you don't kill anybody like if you're driving, it's not like driving a car. So my tip is get in the game. I mean, if you don't, if you want to, 
I've had big arguments with people about, you know, well, what about scientists who don't want to communicate and who don't feel they're good at it? Fine, I get that. That's okay with me. My only request for those people is don't diss the people who are good at it or do want to do it. Give them a break. You know, they're they're doing something that's good for science, good for your science, and will in the end, I believe, help you. Um, so, you know, don't say if you were a real scientist, you'd be working in the lab now instead of talking to the news hour on PBS or something. Uh, but but the main thing is if you want to do it, do it. You know, you don't know what opportunities you have. Uh, <laughs> I heard a story. I guess I shouldn't say who was who was telling the story, but he was riding in an Uber the other day. And they, uh, the Uber driver was playing gospel music, and he really likes, this guy really likes gospel music. So he started singing with the Uber driver. So you strike up a conversation with an Uber driver about what you do or why you do it, and you can talk about your science, and you can practice on that person. I'm just saying, you know, nobody's going to walk up to you and say, hey, tell me about your science. Sometimes they will. It depends on what kind of a party you go to, but most of the time they're not. Um, but you can always generate some discussion and people will be interested in that science communication because, you know, I do it to a lot of people, but it's the same as doing it to one person. I just just happen to have a lot of people listening when I do it. Yeah, taxi drivers and hairstylists are both really good right. audience to test yeah. whether you're communicating at, a, at an acceptable level. Uh, so first of all, Joe, we have a lot of fans of your cat. So you're <laughs> very welcome. Uh, we're getting the screen now. <laughs> yeah, animals are always pluses. Uh, that's an, an official NIH statement. So we have a lot of questions coming in. One is um, related to I think what you were just saying in a world where misinformation is spreading so fast. I think this is particularly relevant to your COVID-19 reporting. What, what should we as scientists, scientists at NIH, be doing more of? Yeah, um, uh, uh, <laughs> well, there is, a, there is a body of research now, I'm happy to say, um, that's trying to understand how you combat misinformation. Um, I don't think they've reached the perfect answer, or if they have, they haven't done a great job of disseminating it. Um, but the... Uh, uh, I sort of feel like uh, as a journalist and probably as a scientist too, you don't have um, that many degrees of freedom in how you express what you want to say. I mean, I feel, I feel bounded by what we used to call facts. And I don't feel like I can stray that far beyond facts because that's the only thing I'm supposed to be reporting on. Same with scientists. So in a way, you have to just stick to explaining things whenever you have the opportunity. And that's Part of my uh, uh, interest is getting people to um, show willing uh, and come out of you know come out of the lab and talk to people in in settings that might make them a little uncomfortable. But that's the other thing is I do know for sure I know that this has been borne out by research that you can't lecture people. Uh, uh, you can't um, you can't raise your voice and say, and you know, please don't say how stupid can you be, even if that's screaming in your head. Um, the you know, people don't respond well to that kind of a message, and it it doesn't feel to me like the people who believe in the goofiest of the science misinformation theories are really interested in information. Um, there's, there's something else going on there. And I don't think any amount of, I don't think any amount of calm, clear, accurate information is gonna change their mind. But I don't know what else we people who communicate on the factual basis can do or should do or are supposed to do. I just. I just think there are limits into what we can do. So I guess the answer to the question is keep trying. Because, I mean, if, if we just give up uh, and say, well, you know, believe whatever you want, all this stuff is nonsense. I mean, I don't think that's good either. I think people should be at, at least informed 
about what is and isn't known by people who are worth listening to. And that, I mean, again, you mentioned this, uh, Joe's big idea and the psych, the beat, the psych commerce. So my goal for them, these are, I was trying to help young scientists who wanted to become better communicators, you know, and just talking to them about some of the things we've been talking to now. But my ulterior motive was to build what I think of as a tidal wave of information to push back the tidal wave of misinformation. And so I figured that if I can get thousands or tens of thousands of scientists to tweet, um, Facebook, TikTok, you know, whatever, whatever moves them, go to, go to malls, go to, go to meetings, go to Kuwani's club. I mean, whatever, whatever circumstance there is, I just thought that we could, that, 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 uh, that, that would help push back on the flood of misinformation. And the, and the other thing is that, again, we were talking about identity and identifying with the person who's delivering the message. And it's also clear that people tend to believe people that they believe for other reasons. And so a message from me is going to be believed, you know, by my mother and my aunt and uncle and people like that who know me and think I'm reliable. But it's not going to be believed by people who are watching One America Network because I've been bought by the biomedical establishment. You know, they don't, they don't, or I don't know, whatever they think. Um, but there are going to be people who uh, are credible for whatever reason to, to people that I'm not credible to that might be able to give them correct information. And, and again, that gets back to Dorsey. So, and I also should say, by the way, that the NPR Psychomers are now the Boston University Psychomers. So they've moved to BU. Um, if you go to the NPR Psychomer page, there'll be a redirect to BU. BU is still going strong. I mean, it was, it's, it's, I, I'm not, I'm not directly associated with it anymore. At least I'm not, I mean, I'm, it's not at NPR and I am at NPR. But um, I am really proud of the fact that this uh, has become a force. And anybody who's a scientist that's interested in science communication can join, doesn't cost anything. Um, and it's a great way to talk to people who are already trying and will give you advice about what they've learned uh, at the drop of a hat. So if uh, people listening do want to join, would they go to the website or? Yeah, just go to BU NPR Psychomers and there's a link that says, you know, sign me up. Uh, or, you know, anybody who wants to can send me an email and I'll forward it. I'm Jay Palka. Uh, actually, the best address for me now is jpalkanpr at gmail.com. So I'm not, I'm not as, you may, as you mentioned at the top, I'm not at NPR at the moment. And so because I was getting like 300 emails a day. I just decided that I, it wouldn't be really a fellowship or a break from NPR if I tried to read my emails. So I just pretty much stopped. In fact, if you send me an email to NPR, you'll get a very um, snarky response, which I think, Sarah, you saw. I definitely got it. I definitely got that one. <laughs> I have, an, I have an auto response. out of office. I have an auto, out of office that includes, I mean, the most of the email I get is from uh, people pitching stories to me. And um, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not 100 percent opposed to it. I understand that's you know some of where the stories come from. It's the ones who pitch me stories about musical bands. I mean, why why in the world would you pitch a story to me about a new band or a new skin cream or something like that? It just drives me back. And those are the people who always write to me. They following up, circling back on that email I sent you. And so anybody who says circle back to me is already in big big trouble. You just got to set it. You got to set up some filters. I did. I filtered the extreme. Everything goes to garbage. <laughs> no, not that kind of filter. Okay. Okay. So we, we have a lot of questions about genomics and then a lot of questions about, you know, the, the nature of some of the stories you've covered. Um, boy, where to begin? Okay. Let's see. Uh, here's a fun one. What science story was the most fun for you to report? Oh, um, well, I mean, I, it, it's, it's kind of a cheat because it just doesn't happen very often in science, but I, I, I really enjoyed the first Mars landing, um, 1997. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something to me, and it's funny because 
seeing the surface of Mars was one thing, but seeing something that was completely obviously 100% made on Earth on the surface of Mars, to me, was really a blow you away moment. And um, it's it's so, I mean, it's so rare that it happens. And, you know, I actually, it's very funny, too, because I, one of the most exciting moments um, I had in science, it still hasn't, it hasn't gotten on the air yet in science coverage. I was talking to somebody and I, and honestly, at the moment, I can't remember her name, but she was working with uh, the gang in, in England that were um, studying uh, embryonic stem cells. And she was taking me through this really uh, difficult uh, to follow, but very fascinating uh, set of experiments she had been doing to prove that a particular cell was pluripotent. Uh, and she set it up beautifully because at, at one point, we, we've been talking for a long time, I have a recording of this. She just said, and then I saw this thing, which told me that this cell was behaving uh, like an embryo. And, and it, you know, it had never done that before, something like that. And I, and I remember thinking, this is amazing. I mean, it's one of those, you know, moments when you take the gel out of the machine and you look at it and you go, holy, but see, you know what, just, this is it. That doesn't happen very much in anybody's life, but this story she was telling me captured me. But the funny thing is about uh, radio and, and about reporting is that it was so um, obscure and required so much explanation that the buildup to the aha moment would just would just never have made it into an interesting story. It just was too fraught. And even though I would have said, and here's the punchline, everybody would have gone, well, okay, you know, maybe mm -hmm. with 10,000 words, I could have built it up to something and then it would have been a payoff. But I just didn't think it would work in radio. And so I've never aired the tape, but I've kept it. It was very interesting. Well, they, they can be in the Joe Palka archive. That's right. That's right. The, the, the Joe Palka time capsule. Well, yeah, buried, buried somewhere under yes. the IH campus. That's right. Under the new building. I'll put it in the That's right. cornerstone. <laughs> okay. So we, I, we have a lot of genomics fans on here. So we got we to gotta play to our genomics base. And I know you said the Mars landing was, you know, the most exciting story you ever wrote, but you really meant the human genome project was the most exciting story that you I did. Wrote. I did mean that actually. Yeah, thank you for thank you for that correction. <laughs> no, I was um, I, I was pretty uh, pleased in in 1986 to write the very first story about uh, plans to do a human genome. I think we got a, a picture mm -hmm. of that. I can tell the story of that. I mean, um, I think it might have been Sidney Brenner who was big fans of nature and was always talking to John Maddox or Peter Newmark, the editor. And he had come back from this meeting at Santa Fe, New Mexico. And he, he said something like, you know what those crazy Americans are thinking about doing? They're thinking about sequencing the human genome. And uh, so Peter Newmark, the deputy editor of nature called me up and said, why don't you check, check into this? And he gave me some names of people to call. And yeah, that's what they were proposing. And they did a back of the envelope calculation. It was going to be, you know, a dollar a base pair, which turned out not to be that far off. And, and so I wrote this article. And um, I think for a while, I don't know if it's still up. I, I couldn't find it when I gave a quick look. The, the, there was a timeline of the human genome on the NIH site. And uh, this was pictured. Yeah, there it is. Now, uh, the interesting thing is, at the time, as you can see from the headline, um, NIH didn't have a, wasn't in that game. It was a guy named Charles DeLisi, who had um, wanted to do something with a supercomputer, because he thought that biology was going to be computational. And, and this is 1986. And people said, what do you need a computer for, for biology? And he said, you just wait. And oh my goodness, was he proven right? Um, but he left NIH. He was at NIH and went to DOE because they had a bunch of supercomputers. And um, that's why I was out at Los Alamos or yeah, Los Alamos, I guess, because they were talking about, well, how would you piece this thing together? And you know, there'd be a lot of computational stuff. And, and that's where he thought computers would play a big role. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, I follow the story uh, uh, pretty closely. Um, uh, and I mean, when Jim Watson was named the first head of the genome project at NIH, there was this struggle of the titans where NIH wanted to be in charge and DOE wanted to be in charge. And I guess in the end, NIH won. Um, um, and then a funny thing happened, and this is just personal, and some people in the audience may know this already, but uh, I stopped reporting on the Human Genome Project almost entirely um, in the mid-90s uh, uh, because my wife went to work for Francis and Francis Collins, and she had a big hand in this, the lead up to the um, to the to the announcement anyway, and well, and certainly from the policy standpoint, to the uh, to on the genome project, and it was a conflict of interest for me to report on on that, so I stopped, and it was kind of weird because it was one of the topics that I knew the best and had a lot of, of contacts and talk people to talk to, but um, it was just it wasn't possible for me to to do it. And I, I remember, I mean, it's a very Washington moment um, when we were in Rock Creek Park with my son and we're singing happy birthday and the, her cell phone call, this is like 1999 or 2000, and the cell phone rings and it's the White House and they have some detail about the announcement of the completion of the genome project. So he's just a runaway while my, everybody else is singing happy birthday to my kids. So um, that was a funny moment. Uh, just one of the most historic moments in science and, you know, during yep. birthday. Yep. Yep. Well, I, um, I think, so a few more genomics questions. We've got, are there persistent misconceptions about genomics or any that you encounter over and over as you report on science? Well, I think, I mean, I, I think this is, it's, it's not really a misconception, but maybe a misexpectation. And you'll forgive me, but I think that the promise of genomic medicine has been a little bit oversold. And it's such a powerful concept. I mean, I remember in the early days of gene therapy, you could just say, wow, you know, you just fix one gene and it's and then the person is a hundred percent better. Ooh, it was a little more complicated than that. And it was a little more complicated to do the fix. And it was a little more complicated to figure out how to do the fix. And I mean, it it sounded so promising. And then, uh-oh, cat's back. <laughs> oh, now my dog's barking. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, it, it turned, I mean, it, it just it just felt to me like it was out of balance. And so um, um, I'm going to tell my son to feed the cat. He will do that, I think. Please feed cat. Please feed cat. What's your cat's name? Uh, Tom. Oh, he, had a, gonna... he had a brother uh, once named Jerry, but Jerry didn't. Jerry met a fatal accident. Very sad. Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, you kind of made that happen by naming them Tom and Jerry. Yeah, I think probably. Yeah. Um, we, we have a, a question from Eric Green. I think we have to answer this one. It says, well, first it says, thank you for participating in our series. You're very generous with your time and you look true. Very, very nice. Haircut, yeah. yeah, he likes your hair. Two, serious question in light of the recent anti-science politics is the main answer to, is the main answer for more people to communicate accurate science, or do we need to prune back some of the people who are communicating science that are <laughs> highly targeted by some? And then he also wants to know if you've uh, used your microphone to dust around your house or play with the cat. <laughs> okay, um, to answer the first, the last question first, you know, they, they actually give us, when they give you this, that, that thing is not, so this is actually, um, just to, so, this is the microphone. This is the windscreen. So the microphone itself is, 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 is it's called a directional microphone. So it's a shot. You don't call it a shotgun when you're going through TSA. I can tell you that at the airport. But um, 
it's it's directional and, it, and it's very sensitive to wind noise. And so supposedly this picks up wind noise, but they gave us a brush to keep it fluffy. I think it's hilarious. Um, no, I haven't used it to play with my cat, Eric. <laughs> Hi, Eric. Thank you for inviting me, by the way. Uh, or thank your staff for inviting me. Or, yeah, I think we talked about it, actually. Um, I... I uh, this this is where the the um, the science of science communication diverges from what I do as a science communicator. Um, there there may be an argument in favor of taking some people out of the limelight or out of the crosshairs, as it were, um, because they've been so uh, radicalizing. Um, and. I can think of some people at NIH that that might apply to. Um, I, again, I I think I think diversifying the people delivering the message is really the what I would have to say I think is most important. And if it's if it's all going to be a bunch of people who look like you and me, um, and by you I'm talking about Eric, and Eric is much better looking than me, so I forgive me for saying that we look like each other, but we have certain qualities in common. Um, and, and I think, I, I really think that it's, you know, we will do it right, of course, but, but um, and certainly, I mean, none of the people who are speaking on behalf of NIH, I don't think are mis mistaken, um, but I think variety is important. And, and honestly, I've always thought it was important. Um, you know, Francis doesn't wear it on his sleeve so much, Francis Collins, but he is a very religious person. And I think that's important to identify him that way because not that many scientists feel comfortable about talking about their religious uh, persuasion because it's irrelevant. Well, yeah, it is, it is irrelevant or it isn't, but, but um, it, it's important to some people. And uh, so I think uh, when you identify as somebody who's deeply religious and still have a bunch of clear, clear eyed notions about where disease comes from or how viruses work or something like that, um, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it speaks to your earlier answer about sort of a collective action on the part of scientists and science communicators. Oh, okay. This is a question that, that actually dovetails with um, something I wanted to ask you about from our previous conversation, because I, I, I know you mentioned that the way you choose stories has evolved somewhat over the years. Um, and you know, I, I wonder how, whether that's because you've become more experienced at choosing stories and you've seen which ones resonate and which ones don't, or you're, you're telling them across different platforms and are you, oh man, okay, but then. I, I, I'll answer, your guesses are wrong, but I'll tell you um, what has evolved. Mm -hmm. um, so, I prefer the radio as a platform. Some of my stuff has been on podcasts. I don't, I mean, I, I'm a little confused about what a podcast is if it's not just a radio story with music, um, but- uh, Have you heard a podcast? Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me has a podcast. Sounds just like the radio show. Um, I mean, I, I'm on up first a lot of the time. It sounds like the first segment of all things morning edition, which it is. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I mean, this American life is different because it's a different topic, but what makes it different from a long radio show is it's a story with powerful music behind it or radio lab. Also people talking about science in a different sort of way than I do it, but I could imagine hearing a radio program. There's nothing wrong with having a radio program that's that, like This American Life or, or, or Radio Lab. It's just that NPR doesn't choose to do that. Fine, okay, that's all right. Um, so more to the more what's so so anyway. So what how, how I choose a story is is almost never what I think people want. Mm -hmm. um, there are times when. I think something is newsworthy and I get it, you know, that, that people 
it's newsworthy that there's a vaccine being developed for COVID-19. I don't know if people want to know that, but in my opinion, they should know that. So I tell, I tell them that. Um, I think it's interesting to understand how vaccines work. I think it's interesting to understand why some of them might cause side effects. I think it's very interesting to try to explain why rare side effects are rare and, you know, more, more likely as, as, you know, there's a, there's a great story that I like to tell about, um, about understanding um, risk, which is somebody at, at uh, CERN, the, the uh, high energy particle collider in Switzerland and France said to me that your chances of winning this lottery are the same whether you buy a ticket or not. And that's very counterintuitive because everybody says, well, you have to buy a ticket to win. But if you think about it statistically, the chances of your winning are so small that they are essentially indistinguishable from zero. And so it's not the same with the, with the, uh, the vaccines. There is a chance. I mean, your chance of getting a vaccine associated side effect is zero if you don't get the vaccine. So in that sense, it's true. But if you do get the vaccine, it's not quite the same, but it's more like you're winning, you, you would be winning the lottery if you got a side effect because of how rare they are. Now, it's not true, they're, they're more common than winning the lottery, but, but that's the point is just to understand that people's ability to make judgments based on size of risk is, is a little bit, it's not flawed, it's just what, what, we've, what we do as human beings. We don't think uh, that, uh, that like statisticians. Um, but to get back to your question about what I like to cover, what I started to cover is I, I got tired of covering results in science, because if you listen to the radio or read the newspaper, you get the feeling that science lurches from discovery to discovery. I mean, there's, there is something new every week. And because it's on NPR and because it's in the New York Times and because it's in the Wall Street Journal, it must be important. I mean, we wouldn't be telling you about it if it wasn't important. But the fact is that 99% of the stuff that we report on isn't that important, or you know, it, it may or may not be, but we present it as this is, this is the big deal. And I felt, I felt that it would be more appropriate to tell people about how the process of science and how you, how you get from, I don't know how this works to now I think I have a better idea of how this works. And, and so I started choosing stories that had interesting process, but no one could be confused about thinking that they're important. Um, and I don't know if you have time to show this, this other slide I, I sent you, but I did a, a story about um, the electric dipole moment of the neutron. And I promise you, nobody in my 30 year career has ever asked me if I would please do a story of, on the electric dipole moment of the neutron. But it turns out that it's an important physical property and it might have something to do with why the universe exists. <laughs> So I didn't know how to start this story. Um, so I thought I'd nail it down to why corned beef sandwiches and the rest of the universe exist. <laughs> I still like that because I love corned beef sandwiches. <laughs> some, people, some people felt that was a cheat because they wanted a story about corned beef sandwiches. And I was telling them about the electric dipole moment of the neutron. <laughs> and, you know, I apologize to all of them, but I'm, I mean, I got them in the door, you know, and if I can get their attention for a few more seconds, maybe they'll be interested in what I am talking about. So uh, I just started doing things that I, that I, I mean, I had a story on the air about what you serve a colony of captive locusts and um, I mean, what you feed them. And oh my goodness, there's another one nobody was ever interested in, but you know, it's a critical thing. If you want to study locusts in a laboratory, you got to feed them. So what are you going to feed them? I mean, I asked the guy, is there locust chow? And he said, no, but well, there is a kind of a locust chow, but it's switch, what do they call it? Something grass, something. That's the kind of grass you see in new, new, um, juice bars and things. I forget what it's called. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But uh, anyway, I, I was trying to talk about the, the things you have to do to be a scientist. A little bit like going back to my days with Jim Allison as a lab technician. You know, we used to laugh. Jim was very funny. He probably forgotten he, he said this, but he used to say, 
Okay, I think we pushed the frontier science back a little bit today. You know, we we would have like this little piece of paper that was the frontier science, and we inch it along the the table <laughs> tabletop. It was it was very modest. Every day was very very modest, and the number of times you have a breakthrough, like he did, is like maybe once in a career, and it was pretty spectacular. Not not that there aren't steps along the way, and and it's the steps along the way that I thought were people needed to understand so that they would get the message. I know I'm not going to change the way science is, is presented in the media because it's, you know, it is presented as news and, and you, you can't, you can't run into the newsroom and say, Hey, I've got this story about a small earthquake where a few people were injured. You know, that's just not going to get your editor's attention. So you have to say something like this could lead to, or this might help us understand, or this might be a cure for this. Because at some level, you do have to explain why you're doing it. But that's why I said this, this rather obscure search for the electric dipole moment of the neutron isn't just, oh, I want to answer something about you know physical properties of a small object. But I want to understand why the universe exists. And that's not my moment to moment concern, but in the end, that's that's what got me interested in this, this particular topic. I mean, I'm speaking on behalf of the scientists now. So, I mean, we were trying to measure HLA. We weren't just trying to, because we didn't, you know, HLA nine, we, we wanted to know the protein sequence. Well, it wasn't just an intellectual exercise. At some level, we wanted to know the protein sequence so that we could understand more about the immune system. And uh, the immune system is important. And oh, by the way, if you want to have a healthy immune system and fight off diseases, you better know it, it's helpful to know how it works. And it's pretty complicated. So anyway, that that's what I started doing. I started doing these stories that said, you know, how did we get to this? Well, at least that's what I was trying to do. And again, I picked things that that I found interesting, curious, compelling, strange. But I, I almost never picked things because I thought they were newsworthy. Hmm. I, there's a lot of pressure in public information offices to to frame things as very big or exciting discoveries. So I think the uh, the chain is long when it comes to that sort of thing. That's probably why your inbox is so full. Well, no, well, yes, it's but it's it's full of people who are trying to get me to do the story because it's so important, and mm -hmm. and I'm. I, I mean, I, I'm okay. So I'm a journalist too. And I certainly know that, you know, uh, people want to be on the front page. That's, that's sort of what, that's, that's sort of the currency of, you know, you, you succeeded when you get on the front page, but I, I had one more slide. I guess this is an excuse oh, yeah. to show it. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I put this up is the last story I did before I went on fellowship lead. And the interesting thing about these are two scientists, um, Peter Hose, Hotez and Mary Elena Botazzi. And I met them when they were both at uh, GW and now they're both in Texas at uh, Baylor and Texas Children's. And um, I actually interviewed them in July about a vaccine they were working on. And I never got around to putting the tape on the air because they were telling me, oh, you know, that they had a process that they thought was easy, you know, less expensive, older technology, but it would work and it might be good for the developing world and et cetera, et cetera. So it turned out that right around the end of the last year, December, um, the Indian government decided to issue an, what amounts to an emergency author, uh, use authorization for this vaccine so that it could be distributed in England, in India. And there were like 100,000, no, 100 million doses that were going to be made. And suddenly this story it was sort of, a, which, which was so unimportant in the sense that I didn't even think I had to put it on the air. And if I had, it would have sat around, um, became the lead story for that day's news because I was able to tell it and there was a news peg. And to me, I just think it's funny that you can do the lead story using tape from six month old tape. I also had tape that I just gathered. So I had something knew about it, but that was the, and, and I'll tell you one other funny thing, um, this page on NPR, I haven't looked in the last month or so, but before that it was 
the most viewed page on NPR by one million, even more than Steve Inskeep um, talking to Donald Trump. So uh, wow. I, was pretty, I was pretty pleased about that. That's pretty incredible. So a Texas team, see, that's the headline. Mm -hmm. and, and it, and it, and it, and the, the key word for me is could, right? Mm -hmm. and in the end, it might not be. And that's why I feel we're always sort of raising expectations. And I did this too. I, I think it's an interesting story what their vaccine is, but it wouldn't have gotten on the air. And it's partly, I mean, getting stuff on the air is more difficult in the COVID time because there is so much science news that people want COVID, COVID, COVID all the time or at least our editors do, it seems like. But uh, this was, in essence, here's an idea for a vaccine that's different from everybody else's idea, and here's how we went to work on it. And this is why people didn't want to support it to begin with. <coughs> that was the story I came back with, and then I had a news peg, and suddenly I can say, could be a global game changer. Well, thank you. Somebody said that to me. You know, you can always, yeah, stop talking, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> that's my that's my other piece of advice to people when you've run out of things to stay say stop talking well we will have to stop talking in about four <laughs> because the, the, our time will be up at that point um but so we, we have i think uh time for maybe one more question and then um we'll you get to uh say whatever you would like to say that we didn't get to okay you know? um so, I, so this question came in actually earlier, and I, I, I think it's a good question. And I think a lot of night scientists would be curious about this too. So um, do you find interviews with scientists to be enlightening or do you find that you already know through preparation for the interview that, that you know what the scientist will say? Um, no, I, I think I always learn something. And, and I have to say in a mixture of sloth or sloth um, and, and considered spontaneity. I often don't go into um, uh, interviews with a whole lot of background. Um, and I, I kind of, I'm, I justify this by saying that's what Alan Alda does. Um, he doesn't want to know because he wants to have, he wants to be able to have that air of, or asking the questions. You Sometimes if you, when you know a lot about a subject, you forget to ask the questions that, that spring to mind when you don't know a lot about a subject. So because I've been doing this for so long and because I know a little about a lot, I can go into an interview and I'm not saying fake it, but I'm not as I'm not as well prepared as I think scientists would, certainly as scientists would hope a postdoc or a graduate student would be when they walk into an interview. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, again, my how, how do you si do science reporting? Well, you think of something interesting that you want to learn more about, and then you ask somebody to explain it to you. And if you don't understand it, you ask them a question. And if you do understand it, you say, thank you very much, and then you're done. Um, so yeah, I love, I mean, I the interviews are great. I mean, if the people are friendly and e eager to talk, that's there's nothing more fun than that. Um, uh, yeah, that's true. I will second that. <laughs> But just being willing. I mean, that's my, you know, it's what do they say, you know, well, the most important thing is showing up. I think that, and the scientists, I, I, one other piece of advice is for me anyway, don't worry about polished phrases and, you know, all that stuff. That's my job. Your job is just to talk, talk about something, be interested, be animated, be enthusiastic, um, be real. Um, but don't worry about you know, the well-rounded prose or something like that. It's hard to do spontaneously. I don't do it spontaneously. I go back and write and think about it. So we have one minute left and I would like to end on a, an optimistic note. Uh, so what really gives you hope and happiness thinking about um, the future of science communication? Oh, um, that's, a, that's a, actually a good one because I, I, I'm discouraged about a lot of things, but I'm very positive about the next generation. I think NPR has got some fantastic young reporters on the science desk um, that are just gonna do great things going forward. And when I meet 
when I look at the applications for internships, I think, good, no, good Lord, I would never have gotten a job um, if I were applying today. These people are talented, they're motivated, they've done a lot of pre-work that I hadn't done. Um, there, there is a wealth of passion and interest and ability, and I just hope that there's enough opportunities out there and opportunities that pay a living wage so that these people won't be discouraged from pursuing science communication because it is, for me anyway, it's been a fantastic career and I'm sure others will find it that way too if they can make it happen. And I know uh, from looking at the SciCommer Twitter feed that you have a list of science communications people to follow on Twitter. Is that a good way to find some of those folks? Sure. Okay. Sure. It has like 400 people on it, so. Oh, listen, like yeah, well, listen to NPR too, you, you know, or mm -hmm. listen to the pod, listen to the shortwave podcast that they all show up on that from time to time. They're good. Awesome. Well, is there anything else you wanted to add? Do no, I'd just like to apologize for my annoying cat. Uh, honestly, the cat was the second best part. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I uh, we try to get to as many questions as we could. If if you still want to um, have your question answered, please go ahead and tweet it to us, or you can email it to us, or you can save it for the next guest speaker. We're going to have Magdalena Skipper from Nature joining us in May, um, so she will be talking about a lot of the editorial processes at Nature and the role that journals play in the scientific ecosystem. All right. Well, thank you again, Joe. You're welcome. All right. Have a good evening. Thanks. Talk to you all later. Thanks for coming.